Don't lie to me that you only have Bitcoin. I know you have the dollar. When was it uh, first introduced? Somebody scream it out. This is going to be a highly interactive conversation. 1914, I hear one. What? Oh, somebody read that spam. Yeah. Actually, the U.S. dollar comes from the Civil War where Abraham Lincoln decided borrowing money from banks was a dumbass idea. And he created the greenback. Does that ring a bell for anybody? And there are actually little stories that are all bullshit that go into the Internet scumbag sort of uh, uh, history file that somehow, some way, the U.S. dollar was there during the revolutionary times and that during the Revolutionary War there were actually Jewish heroes that provided capital for the fighting of the Revolutionary War and that's why there is a Star of David on our currency today. There was no dollar bills back then. It was a bank dollar, it was a state dollar, it was a whole bunch of stuff, but it wasn't the thing you have in your pocket. The thing you have in your pocket is from, 19, is from 1850, roughly, and it is about time that it gets replaced with newer technology. If I have a fundamental belief in Bitcoin, the currency, and that fundamental belief comes from the fact that A, we are dealing with a patched up, old fashioned, antiquated currency model across the board. And that it, just like LPs and CDs, needs to be replaced and gone through a revolution in which ultimately we use electronic currency. And yes, it has to be secure and all of those other things. But that fundamentally gives me the belief that somehow, some way, this stuff called Bitcoin is going to survive. And I am a real believer. On the other hand, I also know that as much as of a believer I can be, there is also the chance that this is a kind of an Ebola. You know, it catches fire so fast and self-destructs because of its own power and ability to create problems. So I'm not here to tell you that it's 100% sure. But it certainly is 60, 70, 80 percent sure. The problem that I also see is that in this audience, we keep comparing it to the U.S. dollar, which is arguably the one sane or one of five or six sane currencies that has survived and is now potent in the geopolitical sense. People cherish it. They use it on the basis of creating political bribery and everything else that is good in life. It's the 175 other currencies, and there are really 200, so I'm kind of saying the top 25, let's give them a break. We shouldn't be really replacing them right now. Nobody ever wins going after the top of the pyramid and trying to eat your way down to the bottom of the pyramid. What you do is you start from the bottom of the pyramid, take that Argentinian peso, take whatever Haitian currency, the rand in South Africa that is junk, even more junk than the piece of paper we call a dollar, and get rid of that stuff first. Attack it. The, th the last third of my presentation will give a formula for how to do that best and context of U.S. dollars. But who here thinks that the U.S. dollar somehow has something to do with the United States of America and belongs to the government and is monitored by the government? You'd be surprised to know that the Federal Reserve has nothing to do with the United States other it's an independent body that has existed for the last n number of years. The Federal Reserve was born in what period of time, U.S.? Anybody know the history? 1914. If you need to, if you need to read up on it, the best book I can give you, 
You should write this down. I'll get you a chance to start writing. Creature of Jekyll Island. Hey, power to the people. Yeah. Um, who was one of the finest presidents of the United States who fought central banks tooth and nail? Andrew Jackson, yes, my hero. Jefferson did a pretty good job, too. That's when they destroyed the first central bank. And it wasn't until 1913 that the bankers got back into power with the Federal Reserve. And I think that one of the things you have to understand, and you have to look, in other words, I'll give you another book, too. Instead of just The Creature of Jekyll Island, read The Web of Debt, D-E-B-T. Fabulous, fabulous historical reflection on the fact that bankers have always understood that the real control and the real power in the world is with those that control the money supply. If I can control the money supply, the hell with everybody else. I own you. And I usually have a little demonstration in which I hand out some flip dollars. You have it. I give it to 10 people. There's $10 out there. At the end of the year, I want you all to pay 10% interest. If I have not put any more money into the system, you guys are screwed. I own your houses, your cars, your boats. Everything that you own, I repatriate as a banker. And it doesn't give a shit who's president of the United States, who's president of France. Makes no difference. I own you. And that is where Bitcoin comes into play. This bullshit of trying to get it to be regulated and compliant in some fucking way is crap. You can't do that because it has to become a global currency under the control of no one. Then the chaos that is Bitcoin, the crowd that is Bitcoin, has a chance of survival. If you get too quickly into this realm of trying to make it just another dollar, you killed it. That is a hugely important part of this equation. And what I find absolutely phenomenal is that most of you in the room that are associated with businesses that are trying to promote Bitcoin are trying to emulate the U.S. dollar and the credit cards and all the stuff that actually needs to be destroyed. This is a new start a global start in which everybody plays from a level playing field. All of the underbanked and unbanked and everybody else gets an even shot at it. That's what's going to make all of us safer and better. It's not relying on the Vatican Bank or the gift from the IMF. With all of the power that comes from those folks that wield the U.S. dollar as a geopolitical force, Making countries get on their knees in order to obtain it is where the ill is. And it will, can only be solved by a Bitcoin that is an accepted global currency by the edict of individuals who sign up for it. I usually present this because fractional banking is more than you think it is. There are people that have this sort of economic view of fractional reserve and money supply and everything else. What they forget is it's a religious battle of, of dogmatic proportions. The people who want fractional reserve to exist want to make money in ways that most of us, if we knew what they were doing, would call criminal. Fractional reserve goes back to the days of goldsmiths who sat around and created trinkets. I'm not exactly sure what trinkets they were making back then. I think today they'd be making necklaces for some specific European countries and males who love carrying gold chains around their neck. But. The fact of the matter is fractional reserve says that I give $10 to my bank that is mine and the bank might make that into $320 in the next guy's checking account when he, they give him a loan for their house. And that was pure magic. Some people think Bitcoin's magic. 
It's the other currencies on fractional reserve that is really thin air magic. And it was always the money supply guys, the people who were the bankers, even to this day, perhaps a little less onerous than that might have been in the 18 and 1700s and 1600s. But kings hated the bankers. Most monarchs for 700 years from China all the way to the UK used a thing called a tally stick. The first Bitcoin it was a piece of wood that you took to a stock broker. You put notches into it. The notches signified the value in the stick. The stock broker broke it into two parts. This was called the short end of the stick. If you remember using that last as a whatever conversation piece, this signified that there was a particular transaction and an amount of value stored in the tally stick. That's why our company is called Tally Capital, by the way, just for the fun of it. And Wall Street was originally set where it was because there was an abundance of an enormous chestnut tree which was going to be used for tally sticks. Almost all of the terms, stock and foil, stock broker, that we use in the brokerage business today come from the tally stick. Look it up. The second thing that is kind of fun to explore, especially about the evils of current reserve and all of the things that have made our lives miserable. Any of you like to watch the movie on occasion called The Wizard of Ounce? Yeah, Wizard of Oz. It was really Wizard of Ounce. It's all about met metal wars that were going on between silver and gold as well as a few other things. Look it up, Google it, read it, get familiar with it. It's a phenomenal historical statement of what politicians and others who were part of the creation of the final Federal Reserve or the uh, Central Bank. This was a political commentary on it. The gold on the road to the Wizard of Oz. You remember the lion in there? He was a politician, a specific politician by the name of Bryant. Do you remember him being told that if he fell into the flower bed and started to fall asleep that he would never wake up? That's actually opium. And it's incredible what is in the Wizard of Oz from a political statement and from the education that we can all gather from there. So. My last part here that I want to discuss is where in developed countries like the United States, Europe, where we could actually have a foothold in what is necessary. I think you've probably heard this a few times even in the last two days, but all the good news that is happening out there based on our behavior, and I'm not saying our behavior is bad, it's, you know, we are truly in the Bitcoin world individuals acting out individually how we want to play with the currency and how we want to build businesses with the currency and somehow some way I have a bit of faith that that chaos that crowdsourced energy is going to yield a positive solution but often we're our own worst enemies if our objective is for Bitcoin not only as a protocol, but Bitcoin as a currency survives, prospers, and does well. Every time we sign up Microsoft, every time we put more money into a mining rig, we actually are creating Bitcoins that, that the person who gets it doesn't want. They want exposure to that Bitcoin in about a picosecond. And then they go into fiat currency, which causes enormous pressure 
on the value of a Bitcoin. So when we celebrate that Microsoft is using or accepting Bitcoin for Xbox, we should be actually lamenting that. What we should be celebrating is if we could find a way for Microsoft to keep the Bitcoins. That's the only thing that will be valuable and cause the things that we want to happen to happen. The only positive things any of us can do is use Bitcoin to buy our way into a hotel room and immediately replace it. That's the only counter energy today that we are experiencing to the Bitcoins in the, com in the field of commerce. Every time we get brand new good news, but that recipient of Bitcoin is going to shove that Bitcoin into the uh, sale process immediately, we're suffering. Our objectives are being diminished. So where do we need to apply Bitcoin? Well, certainly into the underdeveloped world. We need it to provide a sense of value to the folks that are underbanked and non-banked. But if we're absolutely certain we want to do that in the United States and take on the fact that at the top of the pyramid roughly is the U.S. dollar and that's who we want to take, I think I have the one and only place that we can put that energy in. And the, the, the marriage made in heaven is cannabis and Bitcoin. If you think you guys are passionate about Bitcoin, you should see what the cannabis people are, how passionate they are about cannabis. Even when they're high. The wonderful part about the cannabis industry is there are now three states in the United States that allow recreational purchases and use of marijuana, cannabis, and there are 30-some states which allow it for medicinal purposes. Since they cannot be banked and aren't bankable, because at the federal level, the banks assume this is a criminal activity, and they don't want to touch it, they end up being in a cash-only business where the cash becomes a pain in the ass. Because in the back room, they've got pallet fulls of $100 bills. Some of these folks are doing $7 million a week. What they should be doing is doing all that business in Bitcoin. They should be paying their employees in Bitcoin. And they're the one and only industry today that doesn't want to convert it into fiat currency. They'd be perfectly happy leaving it in Bitcoin. Then it would attract into Denver, Colorado, the blue jean store, the milk store, the bacon, all my favorite things, and all denominated in Bitcoin. Just like I do not wake up today every morning and find out what is the euro doing versus the dollar and should I buy my milk in euro or Bitcoin or dollars. None of that to a person who is committed to a petri dish experiment where the Bitcoin is the most valuable currency. That is the way to create an ecosystem in which Bitcoin thrives and becomes the dominant currency. Now, I hate to say this. Some of you are not going to like this, but I would say right after all of the cannabis folks start using Bitcoin the way I envision it and the way you guys create business systems for them to use because there's special requirements related to tracking their customers and all of this stuff. So the business systems could be done compliant. Bitcoin could be the currency. ATMs everywhere so that purchasers could only buy in Bitcoin. They could not buy in dollars. No conversion would be required. The next big group in the United States, if you want a tactical warfare um, guide uh, plan to Bitcoin success would be gun dealers. What a wonderful next step. And then after you do that, it's the Pilates instructors, the masseuses, 
the hairstylists, everybody who wants to provide a service and never pay a penny of tax. Yes, this is supposed to be the enabler of how to cheat the government the best. Bitcoin. The dollar is so good at cheating the customer, what the hell are we doing introducing Bitcoin that can't cheat? It's not like we're asking them to cheat, but we know they will. So we want all service providers to live within the Bitcoin ecosystem, never touching a fiat dollar and using their judgment, whether as a waitress or a waiter or whatever their occupation in the service industry is, whether they choose to pay taxes or not. And they'll probably behave very similarly to the way they behave today with the U.S. dollar. But they won't be tempted, like the cannabis dealer, to go back into fiat U.S. dollars, because that's the problem they just eliminated. And if you have this ecosystem formed first in Denver and then Washington and all of the other places, as the laws move in our direction to create additional states where cannabis dispensaries are legal and cannabis dispensaries for recreational use are legal, we have our foothold in a dollar-denominated economy to win. And the energy that I would say you, any of you would put into that bit wage, in fact, for example, you saw, those of you who saw the presentation, you can understand why the Argentinian fellow doesn't want to get a legitimate conversion without the discount that is, uh, that he wants a, a, a transfer of funds. You have a number of those kinds of situations that then can originate out of the United States, filter into some of those other countries that need a cryptocurrency that is frictionless in its transfer, its ability to be moved around left and right, country to country, across borders, simply by passing it along in a internet transaction of sorts. We've got it made. But if we continue to worry about how to make, you know, credit cards that have temporary storage spaces for Bitcoin, we're screwed. Absolutely screwed. And the fact of the matter is, there are a couple of other very important books that I want you to read. The problem with the Bitcoin community, to some degree, is that all of you are relatively young. Your memory, your history of things that are real are like in the you believe they're like in the dinosaur age. You know, I mentioned a Ronald Reagan and most of you go, eh, who? That's a problem. You need to get a little history. And the history that you need to get is how the current currencies came to be, what they were trying to solve, because it will teach you so much about the business plan that you need to develop. So I'll give you two books, both written by a fellow by the name of Charles Mann. In fact, I would make this required reading for all U.S. students because they're dumb enough to begin with. Uh, they have terrible education system until the university level, and then they probably don't have an ability to read this. But 1491 is the name of the one book, easy to write down. And the other one is 1493. It basically covers the world before Columbus and after in a way that nobody who goes to school in the United States ever reads. Because it teaches you things that you are at. For example, the slave trade. Just to give you an example, why were they black? Why do we take black people and enslave them in North and South America? Because they were resistant to malaria, and that's the only damn reason we did that. Otherwise, we would have used Scots or Irish people or, you know, there was no, anybody would have done, but they died too quick. The silver that was the denomination of choice, particularly by the Spaniards, is at the core of a lot of this discussion and understanding. One other thing that I would add is there's actually a book called, by someone else, called 1492. If you get, uh, really excited after finishing 1491 and 1493, read 1491, uh, too. Uh, in fact, I think if you want to go back all the way, and you're into the Kindle, uh, you know, 
library uh, with, with uh, interest, I would say seven, there's another book with numbers only, 1777. It goes back to understanding how currencies and, uh, and, and uh, various economies de developed around the Mediterranean. Now, I am also very sure that what happened around the Mediterranean is only one piece of the story, so don't start thinking that's the world. It's just one little piece of the world, and there's a lot more to understand based on the development of the Indian subcontinent and a few other places. But anyway, hopefully that gives you an agenda. Hopefully it uh, sparks some interest. Hopefully you go out and smoke some cannabis and get a business plan put together. Uh, and uh, if you've got a company to invest that combines Bitcoin and cannabis, come here. All right, thank you very much. Any questions I can answer? Go ahead back there. The debt, the web of debt. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, Bitcoin does have a problem. I mean, for us that have a particular bent on money supply, knowing that there's never going to be more than 21 million Bitcoins is actually a theoretical issue. We love it. But it could also be, as we're experiencing right now, the fact that supply of the money can't be managed, other factors have to come into play to continue to make it a better store of value. And so... If we create the ecosystems and insert Bitcoin into the appropriate countries, into the appropriate businesses and geographies, as we were just talking about, we end up with a better chance of the Bitcoin itself appreciating, becoming a greater store in value, and the decimal points that are involved in the scheme working out maybe a little similar to increased money supply. We have to be able to, if it's going to become a global currency, we have to envision the day where every Fortune 500 company could be bought in a transaction, a single transaction, and that Bitcoin would have to have enough value with which to transact that business. So those are things that are challenges, Nobody has the answer whether or not fiat currencies are going to continue to live in sort of a side uh, chain <laughs> uh, parallel path. But if you look at all of the other technologies, yes, there's still some people that buy LP records. They're connoisseurs of uh, uh, audio files who really, really like that passionate consumption of music that way. But frankly, I think the US dollar is a lot more like an eight track tape. And it needs to go away, just like the euro needs to go away and everybody else's currency needs to go away and be replaced by, if not Bitcoin, then certainly the next generation of whoever comes up with a better scheme for a global currency. I believe Bitcoin has a very significant shot at that. And I think all of us in this room do. But it's going to take some brilliant thinking from a currency consumption point of view, not just finding ways for Bitcoin to replace current mechanisms. Uh, so anyway, that's the answer to that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think that that is inevitable, that it has to go down that path. But the problem is people have actually tried to do that, and the first thing the company does is take the Bitcoins that have been invested in them and dumps it into the market to get currency to pay their employees. So that becomes a requirement that this is a elongated string 
of consequences that we put into place where those that receive bitcoins as investment pay their employees in bitcoin, find a way for their employees to prosper by having bitcoin and being able to make their purchases not in fiat currency but in bitcoin, etc., etc., etc. We're a long way away from that. The question was, would we presumably tally make investments in bitcoin and my answer was yeah we'd love to do that i would hate to find out that providing bitcoin to a company as an investment uh, vehicle price that they would immediately take the bitcoins and sell them in order to have fiat dollars to pay their bills all right anybody else one last question and The question is, will it require all of the VCs and people that I think have been in the stage here, will it require they all buy into this? And the question is, I don't think so. I think that it can be a, gro a grassroots kind of a level. Those are the things that work the best in life, especially when new technologies are being introduced. Just let them die of old age. All right, thank you.